Hello everyone and welcome to another installment of Berta Biology. Today we're going to be talking about the topic of the major eukaryotic organelles, not the prokaryotic ones. Prokaryotic cells do have things like ribosomes um, and some other things you might think of as organelles, but uh, I'm going to be talking about the major eukaryotic organelles, the membrane-bound organelles. So that should be the takeaway from this lecture. Um, so organelles do increase the efficiency of the cell. Um, here you can see uh, a depict an artist rendering of an animal cell, which we're going to be talking about all these parts individually here. So the whole point of it, like the last lecture I talked about in cells part one, um, is to, the point of organelles are to increase the efficiency of uh, the cell. So we're going to see the structure and the, the basic structure and function of each of these membrane-bound organelles and how they increase the efficiency of the actual cell. So the first thing we need to talk about is the nuclear membrane or the nucleus, the membrane that surrounds the nucleus here. Um, it is a porous membrane um, that's going to separate the DNA genome from the rest of its environment. Um, the reason it has to be porous is so that it can let certain materials in and out of the nucleus. Uh, although it is important to keep the DNA contained within the cell, we don't want it completely shut off from the rest of the cell. Um, when we talk about later down the road, we talk about making RNA, that RNA has to be able to get in and out of that nucleus. Um, so it does contain little pores. And here you can see a depiction of that. Um, let me get my drawing tool here. Um, so here inside of the nucleus you can see this this little region that's called the nucleolus and the nucleolus is actually responsible for making ribosomes within the cell. Um, here you can see the inner and the outer membrane of the nucleus, very thin, very thin membrane there. Um, here are the nuclear pores and that's what's going to let the RNA in and out of the cell. Those are the codes uh, to make proteins later on. And then you can actually see these little pink guys uh, stuck all over here. And the little pink guys are ribosomes. So hopefully you remember uh, from talking about cells before and freshman bio and earlier than that, that ribosomes are the little protein factories of the cell. So these guys are going to be responsible for making proteins here. And that's a pretty good drawing there of uh, the nucleus. So there's our first uh, organelle, if you will, or the membrane-bound organelle. Second one we have is the endoplasmic reticulum, or the ER. Um, and the ER is, simply put, a membranous channel that runs throughout the cell. It actually surrounds the nucleus. Um, and it's going to produce membrane and transport proteins. It's also responsible for the production of some lipids that you can actually find in the phospholipid bilayer. So they're membrane and transport proteins as well as some other things like lipids, some steroids, things like that. So we have two types of ER or endoplasmic reticulum. We have the rough ER, we have the smooth ER. We call the rough ER the rough ER because it is actually bound in ribosomes um, or covered in bound ribosomes. So you see all these little speckly dots all over. It looks like it's bumpy it's actually just the ribosome stuck to the outside edge of the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and then second we have the smooth ER which does not contain those uh, bound ribosomes um, but is still an essential part of transport in the cell. So here we have a picture a uh, very important picture. You should get to know this one. You may wanna, might want to might want to copy this photo. Um, the ER is a big part of what we call the endomembrane system. So the endomembrane system. Endo means inner membrane. Okay, that that's what we're talking about here is the membrane system. So this the endomembrane system is used for the transport of things within the cell. And when I say things, I mean membrane and membrane proteins. Uh, so membrane lipids, the phospholipids in the ER, the smooth ER, and the membrane proteins uh, formed by the rough ER with all the little protein factories sticking all over it, the ribosomes. So you can kind of follow my train of thought here a bit. So bear with me here. You'll see this picture later on. I'll bring it up again. But So you have the genetic code in here, 
the DNA. Um, from DNA, we then trans transcribe it into a little sliver of RNA. That RNA is going to escape out of a nuclear pore um, and attach itself to the ribosome uh, on the rough ER where it's then translated into an actual protein. And then that protein is going to travel along the highway here, along the highway, along the highway, and then eventually be packaged in a little vesicle to be shipped to the next stop. So that's kind of how we're going along with this idea of the endomembrane system is used for uh, not only the production of materials, but importantly, very importantly, the transport of materials as well. So let's go to the next bit here. The Golgi apparatus, this one is unique as well to eukaryotic cells. It is membrane bound. Um, it has these flattened sacs and membranous compartments. And all of these compartments are actually used for taking those products previously made by the ER and then modifying them and targeting them to some sort of place within the cell or maybe even to another cell. So this guy here is actually what I like to think of as the post office where the products get sent there, they're packaged, modified, and then they're shipped out to the next spot, which for us could be to some other random place in the cell, or maybe we need to get a product to another type of cell, like maybe we need to get something from the liver cell to a skin cell, for instance. Um, so that means it needs to be packaged and shipped in a little vesicle. Um, so very important as well, and let's come back to that picture I showed you guys before. Um, here it is. So we have the, again, let's trace the flow. So DNA is in here. DNA is then turned into RNA. RNA is then coded for on the ribosome of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, where the smooth endoplasmic reticulum might be making those lipids. Then it travels along the highway, packaged in a vesicle first. But unfortunately, it still needs some some modification to it. Maybe it needs to be put together before it's actually shipped out. So it then fuses with the Golgi apparatus, the stack of pancakes, what I always call it. Um, at, after the post office guy here, the stack of pancakes finishes modifying all these proteins and lipids, then it can be packaged up again in a vesicle and then shipped out to the rest of the cell. So this whole process here is the endomembrane system and used for transport within the cell. So it's a pretty slick process, really increases efficiency, um, and our cells do this very well. Next couple ones, next couple uh, membrane-bound organelles I'm going to talk about you should be quite familiar with already. Here's the mitochondria where respiration takes place, aerobic respiration, um, and you're turning sugar into ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Um, so, you know, very efficient little uh, little guy here. Highly folded inner membrane. So it is double membrane. It has two membranes and they're folded up inside. And you might wonder why is this thing all folded up? The inner membrane all folded up in here. It's actually to increase surface area. By increasing the surface area, which we'll talk about later when we talk about energy in cells, um, the more surface area it has, the faster and the more ATP it can, it can have an output with. So it can make a lot more ATP the more surface area that it has. So we'll talk about that in another unit. Um, and I can't talk about the mitochondria, of course. I mean, let's be real, without talking about the endosymbiotic theory. The endosymbiotic theory, I'm gonna use my little house example. So let's say a very, very long time ago, before uh, we ever had eukaryotic cells, we just had prokaryotic cells, there was a large cell that came along, and it actually, there was actually a little mitochondria or some little single-celled organism that actually got eaten by this larger cell. So now we have a little cell within a larger cell. So what's the deal? Well, what's the... What's the whole point of the mitochondria? Well, it makes ATP. It makes a lot of energy. So we call this the symbiotic relationship because both cells get something out of it. Well, what does the big cell get out of this deal? Well, he gets a lot of ATP. 
So the big cell gets a lot of energy. He's happy. But what does the mitochondria get out of it? Well, you have this big cell, and this big cell is able to provide constant pH. It's able to provide a constant temperature, um, and basically just a great homeostatic environment, a very stable, constant uh, environment for that little cell to live in, the mitochondria. So over time, they actually became one. Um, the second piece of information that leads us to believe that the mitochondria was once its own little separate cell is the fact that it has its own unique mitochondrial DNA. Not in a nucleus, it's just floating around, but that it has its own circular DNA. Hmm. Coincidence? Uh, probably not, um, but that's why it's called our endosymbiotic theory. Um, so that's an important idea to know and understand. Next type is the chloroplast. The chloroplast is the site of photosynthesis in plant cells, so they're not found in animal cells. They're also double membrane to increase surface area. Um, the membrane is actually stacked, and here's the chloroplast there, and you can see it's all stacked within it, and it's, you know, the more surface area you have inside there, the more photosynthesis can go on. Um, and that's also where chlorophyll is located, which gives plants their green color. Um, this is an electron micrograph, so it's, it's not in color, but that would be green. And it also fits under the endosymbiotic origin. Why? Because plants convert solar energy, the sun, into chemical energy, or sugar. So, sorry for this bad writing, I'm trying to write with a mouse here. Um, so it converts solar energy into sugar. Um, so very similar idea to the mitochondria. So it would provide energy for a larger cell. The larger cell provided a nice warm home for the little cell to live in. Um, so it was a good symbiotic relationship. Also, interestingly enough, it also has its own DNA. Uh, these little nucleoid rings, not found in a nucleus, just circular DNA. Um, coincidence? Probably not. It has its own DNA separate from the other cells. So uh, that leads us to believe that it was once its own little unique individual cell a very long time ago. So that ends this topic. And now you guys should have a pretty good understanding on the organelles, the membrane-bound organelles that are unique only to eukaryotic cells. They're great for compartmentalization and really increase the efficiency of the cells. Thanks for listening in, and I will see you in class.